Hello, my name is Patrick Kehoe, and I have the honor of being the editor of an oral history of law librarianship, which is part of Spinelli's Law Library Reference Shelf on Hein Online. Today, we have what we believe is going to be a special treat for you. It is this video tribute to Marion Gould Gallagher. Specifically, the tribute is in three parts. The first is his introduction, in which I will describe Marion as a person by telling a bit about her life and some of her personal interests. I will also mention a few of her many and diverse array of accomplishments, pretty much as Marion would have described them herself had she been able to sit for a traditional interview for the oral history. Following my introduction, will be a special remembrance of Marion, originally put together in 1990 by AALL's unofficial historian, Frank Hodeck. This was just a few months after uh, her death the previous fall. In the remembrance, Frank incorporates video footage from a recording made in June 1989 when Marion served as a cast member in Frank's program at the annual ALL meeting, which was in Reno that year. The program was entitled Overheard at the Bar, Eavesdropping on ALL History. The third part of our tribute to Marion Gould Gallagher is taken from a video recording made at a dinner held in 1981, which honored Marion on the occasion of her retirement. The dinner was held in conjunction with the annual meeting of ALL, which happened to be that year in Washington, D.C. The video includes some personal reflections on Mrs. Gallagher by individuals or groups of her former students and by a few of her many friends. Marianne herself also says a few words on camera, and these might be described as examples of vintage Marianne. Now I will describe Marianne, or as I used to call her when I was still her student, Mrs. G. Marianne was a leader in our profession, including in law librarianship and ALL, probably unlike almost any other. She truly guided the development of our profession in ways that perhaps only the then late Miles Price had done. This is because Marion served in the role, as Miles had before her, of mentoring many who entered our profession and who later became its leaders. Over the course of her 40 plus year long career as a law librarian, Marianne also served as the leader of the University of Washington's specialized degree program in law librarianship. This was the program that had been established in the late 1930s by her predecessor, Dr. Arthur Beardsley. Marianne served as a leader in perhaps even more ways than have most, if not all, of our other leaders. This is, of course, was partly due to the demographics of her era which was basically the 1940s through the time of her retirement in 1981. It was actually a period when there were relatively few law librarians compared to the number we have today, and most of them were still employed in academic institutions. Still, Marion uh, stood out as being exceptional even in her era. Uh, Marion was born in 1914 and raised as Marion Gould in rural Burlington, Washington, which today is about a 30-minute drive south of the city of Bellingham. She had at least one sibling, a sister. After Marion completed her high school education in Burlington, she moved to the east side of the state of Washington so she could begin her college years at Whitman. A year later, however, Marion again moved back to the western side of the state, specifically to Seattle, uh, to begin her sophomore year at the University of Washington. Marion would remain at the university for seven years and complete her three degrees, her BA, 
her LLB, which later became today's JD, and her bachelor's in library science, as many library degrees of that time were designated. As a student, Marion, or so it seemed, occasionally exhibited uh, behavior which later might contribute to what uh, could be called her adventuresome spirit. I can tell you about this only because many years after Marion had graduated, I happened to get invited to join her at a dinner party held in a home in Houston, where I just happened to also live at the time. Uh, I happened to have the car, and thus was Marion's transportation for that evening. The dinner party was held at the home of one of Marion's old law school classmates, and the guest list included at least a couple of others uh, from that class, plus, of course, their spouses. As it happened that evening, Marion and her friends decided to make a cold call to another of their law school classmates. This was, of course, long before we had caller ID, so the caller was truly unknown. The purpose of their call was to ask this other classmate about an incident that had occurred while they were all still students some 30 or so years before that. As it happened one day in about 1937, all of them were at a tavern near the University of Washington when a truck arrived to deliver some more beer to the establishment. It seems that the truck somehow magically vanished to some place around the block, I suspect, while the driver was inside the tavern dropping off his delivery load. Well, when the person on the other end of the call answered, he was asked about this incident. Needless to say, he was most flustered uh, say, and demanded to learn who was calling. Probably thought it might be the police or something. As it all turned out, a good time was had by all, even the person who they had called, because they all reminisced about the caper they had pulled off and about other law school activities uh, those many years before then. Somehow the truck was found, and fortunately none of the conspirators got arrested. How do I know that? Well, all of them eventually became lawyers, but would not have had that opportunity had they earned police records for hiding the truck. Following Marion's graduation from the law school, in admission to the bar, which was in 1937, she was appointed as assistant librarian at her alma mater and thus was able to serve under the direction and guidance of her own mentor, the legendary Arthur Beardsley. Two years after that, Marion Gould moved to Salt Lake City to accept appointment as instructor in law and law librarian at the University of Utah. Marion was to meet her husband, Wayne Gallagher, while uh, she was in Utah. Marion and Wayne married and later moved back to Seattle, or at least for Marion back to Seattle, uh, where Marion succeeded the retiring Professor Beardsley as law librarian in 1944. Marion was to remain in these law faculty and law library director roles at Washington until her own retirement in 1981. Tragically, Wayne died when a fire destroyed their home after only about 10 years of their marriage. They had no children, and Marion just happened that evening to be out giving a speech at a meeting of lawyers, as she often did throughout her career and she returned home, unfortunately, to find the fire department at her house. As a widow, Marion moved in with her widowed mother, and the two women resided together until her mother's death many years later. They initially lived in her mother's house, which was located at the north end of Seattle's Green Lake, which, if you know the geography of the Seattle area, is reasonably close to the University of Washington. Later, they moved to an apartment on the eastern edge of Seattle's downtown. Uh, this apartment, uh, remember at that time, there were relatively few high-rise buildings in downtown Seattle, 
Um, so it had a very fine view, actually, out over Puget Sound and towards the Olympic Mountains, which are farther to the west. In fact, this apartment was to be Marion's home until her own death. Marion died suddenly on October 21st, 1989, after crashing her car due to having suffered a heart attack while driving home from her retirement office at the university. She was 75 years of age. Marion had many friends, both at the law school and outside it, and most certainly within AALL. She enjoyed a large number of activities also outside of work, including attending just about every University of Washington Huskies home football game, playing cards. She was a very skilled poker player, I am told, even when she was in law school, and she was also an avid golfer. Marion also had an adventuresome spirit uh, throughout her life, as evidenced early on by the beer delivery truck caper, uh, then the cold phone call some 30 or so years later, and by the fact uh, that she drove a succession of convertibles over the years, uh, almost always with golf clubs waiting in the trunk for any action that might come along. In fact, Marion was driving one of those cars when she died. It was a Cadillac, white I believe, uh, perhaps in some ways not the stereotypical ride of a librarian or law professor, at least not at that time. Marion's only inhibition, as far as I can recall, was that she was rather camera shy. Marion is perhaps best remembered, however, by many of us because of her more distinguished roles as professor of law, adjunct professor of library science, and law librarian at the University of Washington in Seattle. The library that she managed for so many years is now located in a new facility, or relatively new facility, and it is named in honor of Marion Gould Gallagher. Mrs. Gallagher was a teacher and mentor to many of us in the profession because she administered and taught from the late 1940s until her retirement uh, in the university's special and for many years unique degree program in law librarianship. Marianne's style of mentorship was to lead and teach by example, and this truly made her a role model par excellence. Her service to AALL was very broad indeed, and included such things as being chair of just about all, if not all, of AALL's committees, and there were a lot of them in those days, plus two terms on the executive board, one of which was, of course, while she was its president, which was in 1954 and 1955. Marion also served extensively in leadership roles for many other professional and civic associations, including those such as the American Bar Association, the Washington State Bar Association, the Association of American Law Schools, and even the Order of the Coif. In addition, Marion had extensive service to the broader University of Washington community, such as being on the board of directors for many years for its book bookstore corporation, and she also helped the state in developing the revised Code of Washington, which is the current uh, code that's in effect in the state. She even aided in the work of at least four U.S. presidents as members of various national advisory commissions on library and information issues. Marion was also a, if not the, go-to person for deans, judges, and law firm partners who were looking to hire law librarians. And she had a well-deserved reputation not only for suggesting excellent candidates, but also guiding uh, her students and others that she had mentored uh, in great career-building jobs uh, so that they could advance in the field. Today, the ALL's highest recognition for sustained career-long leadership and service is 
in my opinion, most aptly named after its inaugural recipient as the Marion Gould Gallagher Distinguished Service Award. The naming of this award, by the way, occurred shortly after Marion's death. Personally, I believe that you will enjoy viewing this three-part tribute to Marion Gould Gallagher. Um, those of us who have worked on it have certainly enjoyed putting it together. The following is Frank Hodak's 1990 tribute to Marion Gould Gallagher. It consists of an introduction by Frank. It incorporates excerpts from his 1989 Overheard at the Bar program. Marion Gallagher once said of herself, If I had a job to do, I would do it. But if we were meeting in a city that had a big league baseball team, I would take time off with certain people who were friends to go to the game. I knew so many people. Now you could go to the ball game every day, and nobody would ever miss you. Frank Hodek. In June of 1989, in Reno, Nevada, I had the privilege of organizing and participating in a very special program entitled Overheard at the Bar, Eavesdropping on AALL History. This program featured a number of distinguished law librarians chatting informally about their experiences in the American Association of Law Libraries. Little did we know that this would be the last time Marion Gallagher would appear on the national stage of the American Association of Law Libraries. Fortunately, the program was videotaped, and we are able to offer a few moments from that program for you tonight as our remembrance of Marion Gallagher. so many friends in the association. Joining with her to reminisce that evening were Julius Mark, Earl Borgeson, Harry Bittner, Mary Oliver, Erwin Serenty, and Bill Murphy. I have the enviable position of moderator. I was a raw reference librarian, LA County Law Library. I was fortunate enough that Earl Borgeson, gentleman right here, brought me under his wing and I attended Connell. It was one of the first times they offered Connell. I was impressed by the people that spoke and I was kind of in awe of all these folks and Earl grabbed me by the elbow and rushed me up to this lady here and said, this is Marion Gallagher, this is somebody you ought to know and she was very gracious and uh, made me feel at home and uh, I've felt at home in this association ever since. Does anyone <laughs> remember the first person they met at a convention? First, first person. Yeah. Well, I think well, I do. I think I met Sid Hill. Oh. Um, my first convention was at Old Point Comfort. Old Point of Comfort. Comfort. I hate to tell you, but thank you. Virginia. Isn't there anyone? Virginia. It was, I picked up a car in Detroit and drove down to, well, I got held up by a distant relative <laughs> and uh, didn't get there till just when the boat was leaving from Washington. Tried to sneak aboard and Sid Hill was on that boat. Marion later said of those early days, the most obvious change between then and now, of course, is the size. At my first meeting, I became acquainted with practically everybody who was there. I'm sure there were under a hundred people. About her early experiences with AALL, Marion replied, the association was never intimidating because it was just such a lovely, friendly group of people who were all interested in the same thing. And it was so easy to get acquainted. 
When you first went to Harvard, when Earl first went to Harvard, there, somebody told me that that he was trying to find out where the books are, and he would follow what, what's his Phil name? Putnam. Phil Putnam. Phil Putnam around when he went to get a book, but Phil always managed to lose him in the stack. <laughs> <laughs> I was rather fat and slow afoot then too. <laughs> You've mentioned a name that uh, I've read a lot about and heard a lot about, Bob Rolfe. Yeah. <laughs> now we haven't talked about him. Famous I'd, I'd like to hear your impressions of him because uh, oh, certainly from my reading, uh, if you, you wanted to peg anyone as the quote father, yes. modern father anyway, of the association. Well, he, was a really a, he was a really a wonderful person, a remarkable person and everything. And he, of course, is famous for having come up with the Rolf Report. And, uh, Rolf the, Plan. Rolf Plan. And he uh, succeeded. You know, this gives me a good opening. The one thing that he failed to accomplish or didn't succeed in getting done in his time was headquarters. This year actually is the 25th anniversary of the establishment of the headquarters uh, staff with the first, uh, we, what we started out with was an administrative system. We couldn't, we didn't think we could afford both the headquarters and the, uh, and the, um, and an executive secretary, so we settled for an administrative system. And, um, uh, 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 the other day, I got to read a book called Reflections on Librarianship, and a very good friend of mine tried to give most of that credit to a good friend of mine by the name of Art Charpentier. Oh, yes. You must have been doing that off the top of your head. Did I do that? Yeah. Is that what I said? Yeah. Well, I remember his, Art Charpentier's very persuasive and articulate spontaneous addresses in convention meetings. Uh, yeah. And it, there yeah. were, these people who were planning yeah, knew what they were doing, yeah. but a lot of the membership yeah. could think only, where are we going to get the money yeah. to do that? Well, that's what well, our, well, we did have a solution for that. Librarians were not the only memorable people from those days. For instance, Marion said the following about a very important group to the association. There was another informal sort of communication that I valued very much, and that was the traveling law book dealers. There were some who took regular trips throughout the United States, and of course, being in the West was a great advantage, because they would start in the East and then bring us greetings from all our friends. We were always anxious to hear what was going on with our colleagues across the country, but if you or your staff had done anything scandalous that year, you had better not tell them. Remember those... Jim Kelly? There were those traveling salesmen that kept... Uh, that was our newsletter. Yes. We used to train our staff to don't tell anything about anybody to one of the Carswell men. <laughs> because they were great guys, but they traveled the whole United States. Brown, what was his name? Bob Brown? Bob, yeah, Brown. Bob Brown, that's yeah. right. He and also, Bill, Bill he also, Gaunt. he also Bill. fell down the stairs the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they could bring you greetings from all your friends, yeah. and they were instructed to find <clears throat> lost persons, and sometimes they did. Remember the time they found the I was once lost, yes. No. <laughs> once? It was some fellow who, who ran away with his dramatic partner. Uh -oh. And uh, Boy, the, the Carswell man located him. He came, <laughs> he came he didn't from sell New books, England, but, but he found as this as well. fellow in California. I guess as well, yeah. 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 Uh, My generation takes headquarters for granted and all the sorts of things that uh, they provide. I'm just interested in knowing how you survived without headquarters. Barely. Barely. It was no, more of a volunteer, volunteer. Yeah. Yeah. Or association. It was. Real yeah, it was. I can give you one example, Frank. I was treasurer, and uh, Kirkman Dallas was the official address of the association. The dues came in there. Well, there's always some secretary who needed some money who was willing to work overtime, so maybe for a couple of dollars an hour, she'd type the invoices for the dues, yeah. whatever few bills we had, do the checks, and between us, we did it. 
Is that about? No one. You really couldn't become president of this association no. unless you had some sort of resources available for you for this purpose. And most of us who did uh, get, uh, so we really didn't run against anybody. You still don't, do um, it. Yeah, that's true, too. In any event, you usually go to your dean and say, look, there are, they're suggesting that we take over. Are you prepared to absorb some of these costs? Uh, I need some more help. They would say yes. They like the glory that went with it, you know. How, how did I that did. affect people that were in law firms? I know it took a very, long they, time before they came we from very law firm. profitable law firms. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Most of them couldn't. That business about going to the dean, everyone didn't do that. What mm. I did yeah, <coughs> was give my secretary shingles. <laughs> <laughs> I made you literally broker that. <laughs> well, well, you, you, had, had you really had to have backing even to yeah. be yeah. chair, a right. chair uh, committee, right. and for some committees to be a member because you didn't have, yeah. uh, there was no one to do the correspondence. You did your own correspondence. You did any any work connected with the committee yeah. was with, done by the people who were on the committee copies. with copies out to everyone. Hopefully they would answer. If not, you went ahead anyway. Yeah. Well, um, we didn't have the. When I was president, there weren't any Xerox machines. No. We were still using. Mobigram. Pulling got only 12 carbons. I could get 13. <laughs> Bob Barron, who followed Marion Gallagher at the University of Washington, said in comparing her with other giants of the profession, if Miles Price was organization and professionalism, and Fred Hicks was intellect, Marion Gallagher represents humanity, humor, intelligence, and good judgment. These qualities and more were reflected in a highlight of our evening in Reno when Marion told us about a fishing derby at the Seattle Convention. Let me ask, I have to, I have to move us along. Marion, can you give us a highlight of your convention? You're, or a low light, whichever. Yeah, you have to realize that my convention was 35 years ago, and you expect me to remember a highlight. <laughs> I, I do remember enough to be able to tell you that I can second what Earl said about the fact that we are still fighting the same battles we Lot years ago, but in a in a more sophisticated way. We did that every morning. But I think that none of that stands out the way the 1950 meeting in Seattle, at which I was in local arrangements. I wasn't the president. We had a fishing derby. Hmm complete with leather medals for winners and little silver cups. But we had to go so early in the morning in order to get back to the 9 o'clock meetings that there wasn't enough time to catch fish. <laughs> <laughs> and every, every uh, registrant who signed up for the fishing derby was taken out by law students who volunteered, law students from the University of Washington Law School. There were supposed to be two law students to each fisherman. As the boats got away, there was one boat left with two fishermen who had no law student. <laughs> one of those fishermen was um, Bill Hibbett, the Carswell mm -hmm. salesman. The other fisherman was the University of Washington Law School Dean's 14-year-old son, who was over six feet tall. They had to go without the, without the law student. So they started out. Bill was the only person in the whole contingent who had a bottle with him. He's out there with the man, the son of the man he considered his best customer. When the engine conked out, and the son informs Hibbert that in another 20 minutes, the ferry to Victoria will go right by. <laughs> So they started rowing. 
And Hibbert was a, not particularly rangy, was he? So he's yeah. short. The 14-year-old would roll furiously for a few strokes and then slack up and think it's all they were going in. <laughs> in circles. Finally, some of the local Indians were out in a motorboat and they offered to tow them to shore. And Bill Hibbert was sitting in the bow. The, the motorboat that was towing them was putting up a rooster tail. By the time they did get to shore, Bill was just soaked to the skin. <laughs> Nobody caught a fish except me. And I tried to give my pole to Dot Blender. You, some of you remember Dot Blender, who was a marvelous mm -hmm. representative of, at headquarters of Commerce Clearinghouse. She wouldn't take it. And so it's no fun when you take somebody fishing to catch a fish and not let them hold the pole. <laughs> As it turned out, we, we had to award um, we had to award the cup to a relative of, uh, what was Bob Rolfe's second wife's name? Snook. Helen Snook. Helen Snook. Helen Snook. We had to award the cup to a relative of Helen Snook on the basis of having stayed out longer than anyone else. <laughs> well, that's, that's well, for years I followed Bill Hibbert around, just getting him to tell me that story. Of the <laughs> that certainly is a change. Nowadays we don't have fishing derbies, we have fun runs. Yeah, well, you don't have to catch anything, you just have I to get have, back. At, even at the right, right age, I probably wouldn't have been able to. And responding to the question, how do you want to be remembered by a law librarian? Marion said, Oh, I really would like to be remembered as one who was a good law librarian and who was devoted to the American Association of Law Libraries. If I am remembered at all, I would like to be remembered through my students. This is what one of those students, Tom Heitz, wrote when he nominated Marion for the first Distinguished Service Award ever presented by AALL. I studied under Marion Gallagher in the 1970s and until recently was a practicing law librarian. Now, as librarian to the National Baseball Library, I am accustomed to measuring the careers of baseball players. And had Marion Gallagher been a baseball player and made the contributions she has made to law librarianship, I have no doubt she would have a place in Cooperstown alongside Ty Cobb, Babe Ruth, and the other immortals. Fortunately, Marion chose law librarianship rather than baseball, although I do believe she would have been a great center fielder. And Tom closed with these thoughts. Over the years, she has given freely of her knowledge and experience. Her help and support for others has been an unselfish act, generous, modest and gentle. Marion Gallagher has touched many lives and has left our profession immeasurably better than she found it. This remembrance of Marion Gallagher was prepared with the assistance of Michael Klepper, University of Virginia, and Terry McCormick, the University of New York at Buffalo, who videotaped the original data. Louis Haas and Bill Mayer of the AALL archives at the University of Illinois, who provided the his staff. The editors of Reflections on Law Librarianship, published by the Fred B. Rothman Company in the AALL publication series, from which the quotations of Marion Gallagher were taken, and two members of the library staff at Southern Illinois University, James Duggan, reference librarian, and Betsy Bartlett, media specialist, who provided the technical assistance without which this film could not have been produced. Now we will move on to video taken at the 1981 dinner to honor Marion on the occasion of her retirement. The dinner, as you can well imagine, was attended by many of Marion's former students, 
and just about all of her friends from the profession. The video taken at the dinner was later presented in edited form to Marion as a special gift or memento of the evening. In this footage, I have tried to identify a few of those individuals who appear on camera, but regretfully, I have not been completely successful. Also not shown are most of the colleagues and other friends who attended this dinner. There was really no way to, to record them properly in the restaurant in which we held the dinner. Uh, it was just too crowded and frankly too dark for such an undertaking. Also, perhaps I should mention that the video quality of what follows is not of the kind of quality we expect today. Rather, it is more typical of its era, which, remember, was shortly after the uh, advent of home video recording equipment uh, had come along. And because of that is, uh, and the relatively low lighting level in the room, it's not as clear to, and detailed as we perhaps have come to expect in today's world of high-definition digital television. I will proceed with a few remarks as to what it meant to be one of Marion Gallagher's students. <laughs> Chaucer had his man of law, and the University of Washington has its lady of the law. A lady in every respect who is nevertheless one of the boys. Right. And as one of the boys, she is part of the Old Boys Network. And the Old Boys Network accrued to our benefit as students. Now we might ask, why was Marion one of the boys? And you have to understand that back in the 30s and 40s and 50s, when Marion was progressing upward in the legal profession, that it was rare indeed to have a lady of the law. Marion was one of the boys because, among other things, she was a member of the Order of the Coif at the University of Washington, top five in her law school class, a member, the first president of the University of Washington quarterback club. I think the only female that was ever elected president. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> in many other ways, she was really one of the boys because she could beat the best of the faculty at poker. <laughs> and we really are the beneficiaries of her prowess in those regards. Now, what did it really mean to have been one of Marion's students? It meant that the doors of opportunity in the legal profession swung open wide for us. And that was because of the great respect the profession holds for Marion. She has sharp intellect, an unsurpassed sense of humor, unblemished integrity, and so many other qualities that make her so overwhelmingly popular uh, with the bar, with the judges, and everyone else concerned with law. An internship at the uh, University of Washington Law Library is valuable because students learn not by what Marion said, but by what she did. It was a very rewarding experience. And her graduates learn far more than they ever realize, for it is the opportunity to do and learn rather than the formal educational structure that makes the program so rewarding. The positive philosophy of service that she imparts to her students is one of the qualities that sets them apart from their competitors in the business of law librarianship. And 
To my way of thinking, Marion is one of the greatest political librarians of all time because she knows how to seek out the sources of power and enlist them in the cause of law librarianship. Her involvement in professional organizations and national commissions has led to countless improvements in law libraries throughout the world. She is in herself a high standard that educators seek to emulate. And I think one of the primary reasons for her success has been that Marion has never failed to put the law ahead of librarianship. Or she's a preacher of the law rather than of librarianship. She knows the vitality of the substance of the law and yet recognizes the procedural contribution that librarianship makes in finding legal information. And it's for this reason that she's the darling of the judges and the professors and the lawyers that she guides to decisions, to advocacy, and legal writing. And she is one tough cookie. She's tough and courageous in her own right, and she has instilled in her students an ideal to the effect that quality should never be compromised in law library administration. She would never yield to senseless conformity in administrative organization if the value or effectiveness of her law library operation were to be diminished. She recognizes that it takes well-trained people money, materials, time, and authority to give good library service. And she is a selfless person in a dedicated cause for education. And whatever Marion Gallagher has done for herself, she has done for her students. As Marion reflects upon the follies of her youth, she may well wonder why she ever sponsored a given student. But most assuredly, that student is grateful to her for her contribution that she made in kindness and encouragement and education. Marion, to your students, you will always be one of the family, livelier than laughter, younger than springtime, and smarter than the devil you will never know. Oh. <laughs> I congratulate you on your past activities, and I welcome you to Hastings and a new beginning. Class of 60 through 67 asked me to say a few words. So, as I said, I would title my song, had I written one, Look What You Gone and Done. I'd probably sing it to the tune of Red Hot Mama or something like that, Pistol Packing Mama. Marion, look what you've gone and done. Since 1948, you have graduated 76 MLL students. You have trained and put into the law library market an average of 2.3 MLL graduates per year for the 33 years <laughs> that you have had your program. Three of your graduates followed you as president of the association. Several of your graduates served as members of the AALO board. Thirty are directors of libraries. Twenty-four are head of academic law libraries. Six are head of private or county libraries. Assuming all 76 are working and drawing some sort of income, the 76 graduates collectively earn approximately two and a quarter million dollars per year. You <laughs> didn't realize you had that... <laughs> I was almost afraid to give this uh, figure here in Washington with uh, being so close to Reagan and so forth. But I thought as a good Democrat, I'd do it anyway. We control millions of dollars, our budgets, millions of volumes, hundreds of employees. See, Marion, what you've gone and done? But you've done more. 
I have no statistics on the number of phone calls you have received these past years from former students, calls for advice, for comfort and consolation, calls for help, calls about jobs, etc., etc., and etc. I have no statistics on the number of letters you have written us or written on our behalf these 33 years. I have no statistics on the number of times we have imposed on you at meetings to get our share of your love, affection, and attention. I have no idea of the number of times we have all said with great pride, I am a Marion Gallagher graduate. Seldom do you ever hear any of, our any of your students say, I graduated from the University of Washington. We don't say that. We say, I'm a Marion Gallagher graduate, because those are the magic words in the association, the ABA, AALS, throughout legal education. Anyone who knows about law libraries knows how magic these words really are, especially your students. Nor are the countless times you have entertained us as Toastmistress. In fact, since Fred Rothman's here, I'm going to see if I can, and Francis Gates, I'm going to see if I can't get the uh, speeches, all of your speeches published as part of the ALL series, publication series, be a hell of a lot better than what they publish most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> to us, you are an inspiration, you are our mentor, our leader, and after hearing your presentation last night of the history of law librarianship, you were talking about giants. You are the giant. Thank you. Because this just can't go on, we, gra uh, we grouped the remainder of our remembrances in a little something we want to give you, which is a collage of some of the graduates of 68 to 73 and we will present this to you to take home. <laughs> Crushed again. Although we want to remember, although we want you to remember us, we are here tonight, Marion, to remember you. And especially that MGG humor, for instance. The time that her dean wanted to raise money to fund a chair for her, but she politely declined, saying she had no intention of being referred to as well endowed. <laughs> but seriously, it is altogether meet and proper that on this occasion we should give testimony of our appreciation to your influence on our lives those 33 years of teaching. In that considerable span of time, every day has been better in some way for every one of us who was a student of MGG. I'm sure we are all aware of what she has done for us in things tangible, for many of our jobs are not in small part due to her. And the enlargement of our fellowship, as evidenced here tonight, yes, we are aware of these things and we bless Marion for them. But what of things in corporal? Let us make known our gratitude also for them. The things that have become second nature to us now, almost like breathing out and breathing in. We have become so accustomed to her grace. I fear we have taken it for granted, for it is quite unique to our profession. Would you join me in a toast to Marion to everything that you stand for, both professionally and personally, to Marion with love and gratitude.
there are some advantages that we found in being the last group of, of graduates. The best one is that uh, we were told the most stories of the successful and the not so successful of those who came before us. <laughs> Mrs. Mrs. G always told us the names of the persons involved in a success story, but the errors and the failures seem to remain anonymous, so you can rest easy. So uh, when you're meeting us for the first or second times, we may have a far away look in our eyes. And that's because we're trying to remember, hmm, I wonder if you're the one who. <laughs> we have some other vivid memories of, of each of our years. Most of us at one time or another worked the circulation desk. And we'll never forget the first year law student who came up to us and told us, that we couldn't possibly understand a legal problem because we weren't a law student or a librarian. Another near universal memory was our running from Susilo to Condon Hall. Now, for those of you who came before us, Condon Hall got moved or a new building was built. It's now about eight or ten blocks away. It's not the quick trip. When we were running, it always seemed to be raining or snowing. We burst into class at the last minute just to find Vicki Moore to tell us and remind us that because Mrs. G was in Dallas or Guam or Honolulu or Phoenix, etc., that class was canceled. <laughs> but you're going to Hastings this spring. That's great. Finally, after all these years, you're going on field work. <laughs> You've sent so many of us off on field work with a list of do's and don'ts that we thought you might not realize that some of those things apply to you, so we're going to give you a short reminder list. Remember, you're a guest, so act like one. Don't be running off to job interviews all the time. And for those interviews you do go to, don't wear green because that's an untrustworthy color. Also. Don't wear a vest because that makes you look like a little boy. <laughs> don't be afraid to say, I don't know. Always date an initial correspondence, including resumes. Here's one Dan Hinky will love. Don't argue with the director of the library you visit. <laughs> Don't criticize or agree to evaluate the library you visit. If they take you out to eat, always taste the food before salting it. <laughs> Don't talk about controversial librarians. You blew that one yesterday. <laughs> And always say thank you for a wonderful time, even if it was the pips. <laughs> now, many of our group also have another remembrance that, unfortunately, I didn't share. I'm not the right gender. It seems that whenever you refer to the women in our group, you call them your ducklings. Now, while you're on field work, you'll be our duckling. And so, you won't forget it, we have a small reminder for you. Does it make a noise? No, it doesn't make a noise. Quacked <laughs> <laughs> And just know that, that our best wishes go with you. Thank you, Wes. There's another... There's another group uh, that's somewhat 
unaffiliated and yet much loved. And those are Marion's special students. I suppose that if she were in the National Basketball Association, they might be referred to as ringers, but... Uh, <laughs> But we are very glad to have them, and uh, Pat McDonald and uh, Connie Bolden and the rest of you, would you do your thing? kind of unusual. I don't have to stretch to see over the top of it. This is in two parts. One of them is a memento, which we give to you with our best love and appreciation. And before I start that, I'm starting the wrong spot. I want you to see who's giving it to you. Am I turned on, Dan? Hmm? You turned on. <laughs> later, dear, later. <laughs> I warned you. understand art. <laughs> Oh, that's me. <laughs> yes, Pat. Denise McFadden, better known as Denny. John Henry Merriman, I think, is not here. Anne Quigley. Art Ruffier, I think, is not here. Marjorie Rushing. Jane Stewart. Come on, Jane. Gail Talbot. Anne Van Hassel. Patricia Van Mason. Larry Wenger. And Tung Cha Wong. Susan Lupton was responsible for the shopping and the choice of the memento. Would you give it to her? We'll claim you. And the we'll claim you. <laughs> we're only working off the official list which we were issued. <laughs> who, who needs to be claimed? We'll adopt orphans. Denny Stone? He's an orphan. Come on, Denny, don't be an orphan. <laughs> We've been trying to tell Denny that this is how it is to be a part of a real law library graduating class instead of from Bull, right? <laughs> we are special students. And, and all you have to do is look at us to tell that we're special. <laughs> but students. Quiet, McCarthy. <laughs> Item one, we got in, right? Item two, we got out. <laughs> Now, I want you to pay strict attention to a definition which uh, started, I think, with somebody before us. But I want you to listen to what it is and how it's done. And then I want you to follow us all the way through all of the choruses. You ready? Sure. Yeah. All right. The word is applaud. To express approval, especially by clapping the hands repeatedly and usually loudly, to express approval of, praise, commend, or to show approval of, especially by clapping the hands. Applause is public approval expressed by clapping the hands, meaning a marked commendation, which is what we are giving to our dear friend and mentor tonight. Approbation, loudly expressed, or acclamation. The first verse goes like this. Ready? Ready. Yeah.
second verse goes like this. You stand on your feet and you do it for a long, long time. <laughs> And now, Marion, on behalf of all of your graduates, with, yes? Is that the final? No, I was getting ready for the final. Would you go ahead and oh, say no. which one? Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. Here. Here's, Can here. I do that? Sure. Thank you. Mm. There is one more class. There is this year's class. Oh. And these, these persons are on their field work now. One of them, one of them keeps insisting that I don't have the courage to introduce them because I can't remember their names. <laughs> <laughs> they are Sri Mamuji from the University of Indonesia. Who's Sri? Where are you? There's Sri back there. She is. She's doing her field work at the Law Library of Congress, and then. There are three men, and I'll introduce them alphabetically, as a librarian should. <laughs> Scott Burson, who's from the University of Chicago and is doing his fieldwork with George Grossman. And Scott's over there someplace. <laughs> Mike Shirazi who is a graduate of Gonzaga University and doing his field work at, at Columbia. And there's Mike. <laughs> and this is the one that really challenges me. This is Charles Mualamu. Mualamu, <laughs> but I, I, I put the accent in the wrong place. There's Charles. He's from the University of Zambia. And he is doing his field work at the Law Library of Congress. And they're going to graduate at the end of the summer. And I hope you will all make them welcome into the Alumni Association. Thing. She remembers my birthday every year, which few people do, uh, and few people do with pleasure at least. Uh, and so we are grateful to her. If the, um, our council met on the uh, 23rd and 24th of uh, May, and when Marion uh, left the room momentarily to find the ladies' room, uh, the council adopted a resolution which they asked me to uh, come to this dinner tonight and to present to Marion. And I will simply read the uh, resolution. Whereas Marion G. Gallagher has served with distinction as a member of the Accreditation Committee in the Council of the Section of Legal Education and Admissions to the Bar of the American Bar Association, and whereas Marion has brought both wisdom and sagacity tempered with delightful humor to the deliberations of the Council, and whereas Marion, through her many acts <laughs> thoughtfulness has pleased each and every member of the council. And whereas all members of the council and this accreditation committee treasure her continuing service to the cause of legal education in the United States, and whereas the council has learned of the dinner to be held in Marion's honor on Tuesday evening, June 30th, 1981. Now therefore it be resolved that the council of the section of legal education and admissions to the bar of the American Bar Association in regular meeting assembled and in the temporary absence of council member calendar, to, to extend their fondest and best wishes to Marion G. Gallagher on the occasion of her special day, June 30th, 1981. Why weren't you there? If I'd known that, I'd have gone oftener. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> Thank you so much, Kim.